Um, we knew that we were in for a lot of bad weather, so while we were there, we'd brought a bag of games and the computer console and a big jigsaw. We brought our slippers. We brought things to make buns with. We'd really, you know, prepared to just hunker down for a day or two. And we had a really quiet few days. We lounged around, we played the games, we made the buns, and we got outside whenever we could in the midst of all of the thunderstorms and the rains and all the rest of it. We rested. Collectively, as a family, we took a breather. And we needed that just as much as we did the out and out fun that we'd had on the last time we went away. They were both really necessary. Both of these experiences fed our family in different ways. And in turn, each of us as individuals were cared for in different ways through those two experiences. Our theme for today is, from the four, is the fourth commandment, which begins, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. But it goes on to talk about rest and recreation. The instruction of care was not just for the individual person, but it extended to their family, to their workforce, to their community, even to their livestock. Adrian's going to speak to us later about that, but not before we join with Susan and her family in the baptism of Alea and Colton. Um, we're gonna start though with uh, our first song and we're gonna join with in Amazing Grace. So if you'd like to, be, uh, to stand with me.
I'm going to ask you to remain standing uh, because we go straight to the baptism. So, Susan, you start to get ready there. Okay. So, in baptism, uh, we recognize that children are raised by a village. The church in which a child is baptized is part of that village. So, we are taking on responsibility today and into the future. So, some questions for us, the whole lot of us, as a congregation. So, let's get these up on the screen. Do we promise to be a support to these parents who cannot raise their children in the faith alone, but will always need our support and prayers? We do. Right, we come now uh, to affirming our faith together as a congregation. So let us affirm our faith. Do you believe and trust in God the Father, source of all being and life, the one for whom we exist? We believe and trust in Him. Do you believe and trust in God the Son who took our human nature, died for us, and rose again? We believe and trust in Him. Do you believe and trust in God the Holy Spirit who gives life to the people of God and makes Christ known in the world? We believe and trust in Him. This is the faith of the church. This is our faith. We believe and trust in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, I'm going to ask the front half of the church if you would turn, and uh, we're going to come down to the tear. Wonderful. Right. Okay. Now, let's, don't touch this yet. No, hang on to it for a wee minute or two. Right. So, who have we got? Colin? <laughs> Kelly? Alexia? Alexia is the big Alexia. sister. And Alea, we're coming to you in a wee minute, Alexia, uh, or Alea. Alexia's going to do the Bible reading for us this morning, so we'll have the microphone. Susan, you're, you're Alea, and do I have Colton? Uh, okay, so we're baptizing uh, Alea and Colton this morning. Uh, Alexia has a that's you, yes, okay. So, uh, let's, oh, we're going to start with you, Alexia. Do you want to read to us from... Uh, Mark, ch Mark chapter 10. People were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms and placed his hands on them and blessed them. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. That takes a bit of courage to do that. Can I just hang on? Just stay there. Right. So, parents and godparents, have you got your wee card with the answers on it? Yes. So, are you in the right place? Yes. It's okay. You'll be all right. Do you turn to Christ? Do you renounce the devil and all his works? Will you obey and serve Christ? We baptize children on the understanding that they will be brought up in the fellowship of Christ's church, that they will be taught the Christian faith, and that when they have publicly confessed this faith, they will be confirmed by the bishop. So I ask parents and godparents, will you bring up these children within the family of the church? By your prayers and example, by your teaching and love, will you encourage these children in the life and faith of the Christian family? Now, Who's going to go first? Who do you think? Well, we'll go with Alea. Well, we'll go with you first. Okay, the first thing is we need some water into this bowl, so let's do that. Oh, right. That's it. Do, you want, do you want to touch it, see if it's warm? Oh, it, well, it's not freezing, but it's not roasting either. Sure, it's not. That'd be okay. Let's go with a wee bit more. <laughs> Yes, but you've no idea what we're about to do, will it? <laughs> okay, right. I'm going to splash some of this on your head. Is that okay, Alea? That'd be okay. And then we'll give it a wee wipe just to dry it. But so, so I need you, Susan. I uh, don't wash my hair. <laughs> no, we're not going to wash your hair. It's okay. <laughs> you get to my stage in life, a, a wipe does. <laughs> okay, so we need you, Susan, to name this child. Alea Caprice. Okay, Alea. Right, I'm going to splash some water on your head. Alea Caprice, I baptize you 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Okay. We'll give that a wee. Okay. All right. Well done. I need to make a wee sign on your head, the sign of the cross. Christ claims you for his own, so receive the sign of the cross. Live as a disciple of Christ. Finish the race. Keep the faith. Confess Christ crucified. Proclaim his resurrection. Look for his coming in glory. Congregation, would you join in with uh, words that begin, we therefore, right? We therefore receive and welcome you as a member with us of the body of Christ, as a child of the same heavenly Father, and as an inheritor with us of the kingdom of God. Oh, well done. Now, we can all see that Alea is standing here. She's a toddler, but maybe a bit more than a toddler now. Uh, but a lot of what we're saying is prophetic and needs to be lived out in the future. So that's what we're praying for you, Alea, that these things will become reality as you grow up now. Colton. Okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, Colton. Oh, you're such a smiler, aren't you? Are you right? <gasps> so, na na name this child. Colton Arlo. Colton Arlo. I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. <gasps> Let me give you a wee wipe as well. Oh, yes, okay. There, you're fine. Right. Oh, crap. Oh, you've got the microphone now, haven't you? Right. <laughs> Christ claims you for his own. Receive the sign of the cross. Oh, dear, dear. Live as a disciple of Christ. Finish the race. Oh, keep the faith. Profess Christ crucified. Proclaim his resurrection. I'm looking for his king coming in glory. Let me hand it back to you, Colin. <laughs> okay. Oh, well done, you. So let's say these words again. We therefore receive. We therefore receive and welcome you as a member with us of the body of Christ, as a child of the same heavenly Father, and as an inheritor with us of the kingdom of God. Now, well done, all of you. Well done, Alea. Well done, Colton, and all the entourage that you brought with you. Now we're going to get you to do something just a wee bit embarrassing. Catherine, is going to take you on a wee walk, would you? Right round the outside. So, as in a sense... Did she take the walk? <laughs> yes. She'll go, I'm sure, Alea. I'll not have any problem going. So, a wee walk around as a kind of symbolic of kind of walking through the congregation and around us. So, will you follow Catherine? Will you all go that way? And we're going to sing, I am persuaded. So, if everybody would like to turn and face front. Do you, oh, you not going?
Please be seated. Lovely to hear a wee baby just crying out amen there at the end. That's wonderful. So it's, I was just saying to Michelle earlier on and to Catherine here that uh, July has started uh, with a lot of activity in terms of church services and baptisms uh, and everything else. It has not yet reached the fourth commandment idea of rest. And uh, this week uh, is another week with some activity in it. Victoria, something happening this week? Getting married, okay. On Friday, I think that deserves a, a rousing round of applause from the rest of us. Father of the bride sitting there, calm. Speech done, Carson. <laughs> okay. And everything's organized. Okay. Rehearsal Thursday night here, two o'clock on Friday afternoon. Uh, wonderful. That'll be great. You know, weddings are great. So are baptisms. Uh, yes, they're full of people who want to be there and want to be part of it all. Now, let me uh, read to you from Exodus chapter 20, uh, as Catherine has already uh, mentioned at the beginning. And God spoke all these words. I am, oh, oh, sorry, sorry, you switched to me. Yes. There we go. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. And then what comes next is what we now call the Ten Commandments. So I've shortened the first three uh, to, one, you shall have no other gods before me. Two, you shall not make for yourself any idol. Three, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. And number four, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. Now, before you think, is this going to be a sermon about coming to church on Sundays? It isn't. It's going to be a sermon about what God was trying to put into the hearts and the minds of his people. It's like an attitude or a worldview or a way of seeing life and of seeing the world around us that was called Sabbath. Yeah? Now, it was organized by the, century, by the Jews all those centuries ago by actually taking one day a week and trying to put it all into that. But it's about so much more than that. It's about something inside of here. But let me, let me take you back. Uh, about 15, 20 years ago, I got the, be no, the second best bike that I have ever owned. Uh, it's called a Boardman Hybrid. Don't know if that means anything to anybody. Uh, but I have cycled around Ireland on it. Uh, and it's a wonderful bike. It's got disc brakes. And when I got it brand new, could I say everything was exactly the way it was supposed to be. The brakes, the first time I put on the brakes, I nearly went over the front because they were so incredibly powerful. The gears changed, the many, many gears uh, changed beautifully, simply went in and out. Uh, the chain was immediate. Uh, the steering was immediate. The saddle was incredibly hard and has continued to be that ever since. Uh, tires were, everything about it was perfect. That's because in the factory, everything is calibrated. And that means, I looked that up, that's a big dictionary, but I looked up the word calibrate, it's a verb, it's a doing word, and it means to determine, rectify, or mark the graduations on something, such as a thermometer tube. So you put the wee lines on at exactly where they're meant to be for that temperature. It's about standardizing things. It's about adjusting precisely for a particular function, or measuring precisely. That's what calibrating something means. It means it's all exactly the way it ought to be. Last summer, I took my bike down to the shop at the bottom of the escalator at Forestside, you know, the, the, the fixes bikes and uh, um, services bikes. It cost me a fortune, right? <laughs> New tires were supplied and fitted, fitted front, front and rear. New chains sized and installed. The original was, had been cut too short, so maybe it hadn't been calibrated properly. New gear, inner cables supplied and fitted, gears adjusted and set up front and rear, brakes adjusted front and rear, bearings inspected throughout, 
the headset, whatever that is, was a bit rough. The top cap was loosened off and headset bearings correctly reloaded. A peach, does this mean anything? Yeah, some of it, okay. Uh, bolt check carried out and bolts tightened securely. Seat post cleaned and greased. Chain lubricated, tires inflated front and rear. He charged me for that. Uh, okay. I, <laughs> yes, I could pump my own tires. Right? And a test ride was carried out. He charged me for a test ride. I thought, I hope he didn't go away for the day on it. But anyway, do you know what he was doing? He, why are my pictures coming up before I get there? He was recalibrating it, right? It had been calibrated when it was set off perfect, but it needed to be recalibrated. Now, do any of you have these in your house? I use this on a Friday night when I'm making my own sauces for Indian curries. <laughs> okay. Shh, just shh. <laughs> I do make my own sauces, but they're not always as good as you might. But whenever you come to weigh things, can you see that there? The wee arrow isn't in the right place. So what you have to do is you weigh things and you have to add that amount on. <laughs> or you recalibrate it, don't you? You turn, there's a wee thing here. and I can't see from behind here like that, but you get it to the point where it's recalibrated to zero. That's what Sabbath's about. It's about as life bumps into us, knocks us about, changes us as we work too much, as we get uh, stressed out over things, as we get things wrong in our lives, as we don't get prayers answered and we don't know why. And oh, Sabbath is about being recalibrated or about recalibrated. It's about putting things back or maybe shifting them forwards, because in my bike, when it was recalibrated, it had to have some new bits put in. But it's about setting it up again so that it functions. Do you remember this? I remember in the early days of getting your mobile phone or your smartphone, there's a setting on it where when you have mucked it all up, when you've done all the things to it you shouldn't have done to it, you put too much stuff in and everything else, that there is a setting that resets it back to the factory where it came from. It takes it back, of course you lose everything in the mixture of doing that, but it puts it back where it was supposed to be. That's what God was saying to the Israelites. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath, is a recalibration to the Lord your God. On it you shall do no work, Neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. Sabbath was meant to be the reset button for all those people. Now, Sabbath in our world, if we decided it was going to be a 24-hour period of time, would be incredibly difficult to keep a Sabbath. In fact, I would imagine it's almost impossible to keep a Sabbath. But Sabbath is about something in the heart. And it's about something that we try to do with our lives. So let me explain to you what the Jewish people would have done as a Sabbath. Uh, it tended to start... Let's do that again. Are you fiddling with my laptop? No? Okay, all right. Um, Sabbath would have started on a Friday evening when everybody got home from work, whatever it was they were doing, came in from the fields or anything. So we're talking centuries and centuries ago. But Friday tea time, it was meant to be as the sun went down, but round about tea time, uh, to average that out for the year, was when Sabbath began. And it began, and people had been preparing for it all day, and Sabbath began on Friday evening by family and friends gathering for food. And it would have been, what you could imagine, big tables, people around. You can imagine the scenes. I'm sure you've seen them on, uh, on TV shows and in movies uh, of families and friends gathered around with the food in the middle and they're eating uh, and they're sharing stories. They're catching up on the week. Uh, they're letting their hair down. They're relaxing. But as one part of the meal, someone, would, they would all have stopped and someone would have told the story of being set free from Egypt. Because recalibration 
for the Jews as a Sabbath meant recalibrating and remembering and redoing the Passover, that being released from Egypt and that being set free. And the nearest we have to a meal like that is communion, where we recalibrate, where we reset by retelling the story of what Jesus did for us on the cross. And we join in that meal. Back in the early days of the church, you can read this in Acts 2 and in the first five chapters of Acts, uh, they actually incorporated, incorporated that into their Sabbath. Uh, because it says they broke bread, which is the phrase in the New Testament for having communion. They broke bread in their homes. So they started to remember what Jesus did in that big meal. Now for many of us, oh, the thought of that is really quite challenging. Imagine doing that in our own house with our own family. But nonetheless, that's what they did. It was about remembering and recalibrating the soul as well as relaxing and resting. Then they would have, uh, that celebrations could have gone on into the late evening. Uh, when they got up on a Saturday morning, uh, one of the first things they did, and you can see it here, is it says, you shall do no work, neither you nor your son or your daughter. So the children don't have any chores on the Sabbath day. They get a break from it all. They don't have to go to synagogue school or whatever else they were doing. Uh, none of the adults in the home have anything to do either because they have prepared for it in advance, nor your male or female servants. So the recalibrating that was going on was not just me getting me time to recalibrate my life or to sort me or to get me a rest. It was about me collectively taking responsibility with the rest of the household or the rest of the workforce to make sure that everybody was getting rest. So do you see how this is, a, um, this is a mindset, a worldview, a heart, an attitude that me getting my rest, if it means a whole lot of other people don't get theirs, is difficult. So we need to be, as a society, as a community of people, making sure that the, if people have to help us get our rest and our recreation on whatever way we take that, we need to make sure our society is protecting them so they get theirs. So there, there's a big heart thing going on here. There's a big community thing going on in this fourth commandment. This isn't about me getting what I want. This is about me making sure that everybody in our world, your sons, daughters, everyone in your household, male, female servants, let's call that workers, employees, staff, the people we work with, are also getting their rest. Even the animals. The animals in those days probably weren't pets. They would have been used for agriculture or whatever uh, the business was. They would have been wearing bridles and connect yokes and connected to machinery and all the things. They were also set free on the Sabbath. They were led out into the fields and set free, not tied up to anything set free so that they too could be recreated. And what I think is being hinted at here, although this was thousands of years ago, so it's hard for them to even imagine what our world would have been like, but the idea of making sure that even our workplaces and our businesses and everything at some point rest or set free. Now again, in our world, you can't do that to a hospital, right? You can't do that to a bus service or whatever. But we need to make sure that everything around us is allowed its Sabbath, its rest, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. So that means refugees, asylum seekers, people who are visitors, people passing through, people looking for work and everything else, that they are all supported and helped, that they too may be refreshed. Way back in Lent, we invited a Syrian family to come here. We wanted to pray with them as symbolic of the refugees who have fled from other parts of the world. And one of them said he has been traveling for nine years. Can you imagine the strain and stress on that life? Going through country after country trying to find somewhere to belong and to live that's safe. So there needs to be something in this heart and attitude that says we're going to look out for those whose lives are incredibly strained, 
and how we're going to help them. It takes me to this uh, picture that Sabbath, Sabbath was a mixture of the two breaks that the Carson family have had. The one that was full of the activity and the joy and the playing and the running and everything else and the Sabbath that was relaxing and recreative, right? Remembering that the seventh day is recreative because it comes at the end of the six days of creating. It has to be recreative. It's not just stopping. It has to recreate everything that's going on in us. So that's what Jesus is talking about here. And when it came to the time Jesus was walking around, uh, the Sabbath had, as always happens, people take something that is freeing and liberating and supported uh, and supportive and good, and we use it to afflict others, don't we? We apply rules and regulations that make it difficult and sad. So, look at this wee story. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the cornfields, and his disciples began to pick some ears of corn. Remember, Jesus and his disciples were on this walking pilgrimage for three years. So they didn't have homes to live in and all that. So they were going through the cornfields and his disciples began to pick some ears of corn, rub them in their hands and eat the grain. Uh, some of the Pharisees asked, why are you doing what's unlawful on the Sabbath? Because the rules would have said you're not allowed to harvest the fields on the Sabbath. It's meant to be a day off for all the farmers and everything. Right. Um, there was a law... Uh, that was not being mentioned here was that the poor and the hungry are allowed to walk around the farm fields on the Sabbath or any other day and pick corn, not harvest it, but pick corn with their hands and rub it and eat it. Because the Sabbath was meant to be a supportive time for people who did not own their own farms or were not growing their own food. So it's about, it's about an attitude of warmth and of care is what comes out of Sabbath for other people. Jesus said to them, I ask you, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or destroy it? Now that comes at the end of a, another little story in Luke 6. On another Sabbath, he went into the synagogue and was teaching, and a man was there whose right hand was shriveled. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. But Jesus knew what they were thinking and said to the man with the shriveled hand, get up, stand in front of everyone. So he got up and stood there. Ooh, turn the page. And uh, he looked round at them all and said to the man, stretch out your hand. He did so, and his hand was completely restored. Jesus said to the Pharisees, I ask you, why does that keep changing? Would you wave at me when it changes if I haven't touched it? Then Jesus said, I ask you, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy it? See, it's about, Sabbath is about an attitude of, I find my restoration, my recalibration in God and in my life, but it's so that I can do good. It's so that I can bring God's power and love and mercy and grace to others. Last wee section, last wee bit from Luke Luke chapter 13. Indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, the synagogue leader said to the people, there are six days for work, so come and be healed on those days and not on the Sabbath. The Lord answered him, you hypocrites, doesn't each of you on the Sabbath untie your ox or donkey from the stall and lead it out to give it water? Remember we said the animals were set free so they could recreate as well? Then should not this woman be set free on the Sabbath day from what bound her? Sabbath is meant to set us free. Being here this morning is meant to set us free. It does something to us and in us and for us. It's about recalibrating. It's about creating a better version of ourselves or yeah, trying to recreate what God always intended in us. So somehow, since we can't ever organize to have this all in one 24-hour period, somehow in our lives, we have to find ways to balance work and not work, uh, exercise and sleep, good food, and the sort of stuff we really enjoy eating, right? 
So, slimming world and what the rest of us want to eat. <laughs> okay. Sorry. If this is going out, sorry, slimming world. <laughs> I'm sure you're wonderful. All right. But, yeah, there has to be something about all of this. The really fun, excitement times and the restful, relaxing times. But it's also corporate because on the synagogue day, on the Sabbath, oh, look at that. On the synagogue day, they used to meet on the Saturday morning in the synagogue, which was like their community center. And they would have talked about their village and talked about the needs and talked about uh, someone who, wasn't, who was struggling at the minute. Maybe we could help them by fixing their fences for them. Or, right? They sorted out their community difficulties together. So there's something about Sabbath, which is about us together, supporting one another, looking out for one another. But it is also about being recalibrated in the soul. Recalibrated in the soul regularly. Now, how you do that, where you do that, who you do that with, there are many options on that. One of the ways is this, to be recalibrated in the soul. Now, I went this week, nearly finished, then we're going to do something together. Uh, I went this week, Janice gave me my list, and I was visiting some nursing homes. And I visited uh, two women on Friday afternoon, uh, one of whom was quite alert and awake, one of whom I have never really seen alert and awake, curled up underneath a blanket uh, and barely a bump in the blanket. Uh, the first one, when I ra read Psalm 121, 120, um, gripped my hand and said every word of it with me. And I thought, over the years, she has recalibrated her soul, that she knows those very words. And they're very powerful words, and we're going to read them in a wee minute. The second one, who's barely the wee bump in the blanket, lying on her side, uh, not really responding to anything. And I said to her, I'm not going to mention any names, I said to her, could we read a psalm together and pray together? And I reached in and held her hand. And as I read Psalm 120, her lips were moving with the words. Her soul has been calibrated and recalibrated to the point of that's what she's aware of. I find that fascinating and very challenging. That I'd hate to get to the end of my life and all I know about is the calories in my food or how much electricity it takes to run something or how to reset my phone. And what I want deep down inside is that the power and life of God is the default, is the recalibration of where I'm at. So I'm going to ask you to do something. Would you do something this morning? You see in front of you in your pews there is a Bible. It would look like this. All right. I took a wee photograph of the page. Page 622. If you want to find that. And I want you to, the part of the reason why I'm asking you to find this is so that you can do this at home, uh, is find the book of Psalms. If you hold your Bible up, it's about halfway through, isn't it? That's, that's a bit of a guess, about halfway through, you're not far off the book of Psalms. There is an index at the front, of course, if you want to look it up, but page 622, do you have, oh, there are some over there, right? And you'll find on page uh, 622, Psalm 121 is the Psalm we're looking at. That's the psalm that I read in the nursing homes. This would be a good set of words that when all else fails, this is what comes out of you. As Jesus hung on the cross, you know those words? Uh, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. He was quoting from Psalm 22. Imagine as you're being crucified, what comes out is a psalm. This would be wonderful, as this was what our lips murmured in the depths of everything. That would be recalibration. Could we read this gently together? Let's just read it quietly together. I lift. 
I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. Would you keep that open for a wee moment, Michelle? Would you like to play us maybe two verses of Dear Lord and Father of Mankind? Let's just begin to enjoy a bit of Sabbath for our souls today. A wee bit of just the stillness. And do feel free to look at those words. Lord, would you help us to find rest from all the stuff that presses into our lives? And would you help us to find rest in our souls where we find ourselves just leaning into you, putting our head on your shoulder, allowing your arms to enfold us? And finding in you the person that you always intended us to be. Could I invite musicians to come back up? Could we stand and let's sing our next hymn? Yeah. 
Take your seats, please, and we'll uh, carry on with our prayers. So the response today for the prayers is, God of glory, hear our prayer. Let's pray. O oh God, our Father, bless Susan as we celebrate the baptism of her children. Watch over her as she may be an example of love peace and joy to her children, friends and all who come in contact with her. Bless Alea and Colton's godparents, Kelly and Colin, as they commit to support these newly baptized children. Guide them as they offer and support, support the family now and throughout their amazing journey of life. Go, uh, bless the children's extended family as they see them grow. Encourage them to pass on their wisdom with gentleness and truth, offering them love and joy. Bless their circle of friends as their lives change and move. Inspire them to be a listening presence, a calming influence, and a source of joy as they share new experiences together. Bless their family and friends and their church family here in Beaver. Loving God, watch over and protect them all. God of glory, hear our prayer. Lord God, we pray for our church family and community in which we are located. We pray for your rest and recreation during the summer months and for your peace and refreshment. We ask for energy to match that of our young people over the summer holidays and for your blessing on summer camps happening in our local area. God, we pray that as we launch Camp Beaver in our own church, you would bless it with children and volunteers, energy and fun, and above all, your presence. Help us to continue to connect with those people in the Beaver area and bring your love to their children. We continue to bring prayers for a youth worker. Holy Spirit, we pray that you are already working in the hearts of the person you have ordained for this role that you would open doors and signpost opportunities to bring them to our church. As a church family, we also bring the Bell family and specifically Victoria and Marley to you this week as they celebrate their marriage. Lord, bless their lives together with love and happiness. God of glory, hear our prayer. Alongside the joys and celebrations, we bring to you those in our midst who need your support and your calming presence at this time. God, we lift up Peter in Canada, his wife and his family here in our congregation as they face the realities of Peter's illness. Give them strength and peace at this most difficult of times. We bring Hugh's daughter-in-law to you now, Lord, as she suffered a stroke during the night Holy Spirit, be with her and those who care for her after this shocking news. We pray for healing and peace at this time. And Lord, we also lift up Adrian and Janice's daughter, Rachel, who is in hospital being treated for gallstones. We pray that you would be with the medical staff and the specialists who treat her and also her husband and young children and the whole family as they take care of her and each other at this time. Lord, we bring to you now in the quiet 
those who need your love and mercy at this time and name them. God of glory, hear our prayer. Creator God, who made our beautiful world and appointed us as guardians and gifted us with everything we need, forgive us for the times we cause it harm, for the times our way of life affects our neighbours. Inspire us to care for the environment, to help rebuild lives and communities, to share in the griefs and anxieties, joys and hopes of all your people, so that your creation may flourish. Father, we pray for leaders and individuals who have the power of influence of global affairs. Inspire them to work together towards unity, justice and equality. May they prioritise the well-being and dignity of all people, setting aside personal interests for the greater good. We ask for compassion and understanding for the mu and mutual respect between nations. May your love serve as the unifying force that brings us all together, regardless of differences. Gl God of glory, hear our prayer. We end with the collect of the day. Merciful God, you have prepared us for those who love you. Such good things as pass our understanding. Pour into our hearts such love towards you that we, loving you above all things, may obtain your promises while exceeding all that we can desire. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. And we uh, finish with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive our sins as we forgive those who sin against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you. And uh, we now stand um, to sing together, There is a Redeemer.
I will lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. May we each know the blessing of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, this day and forevermore. Amen. Please be seated. Okay, a couple of things just to help you get out today. One is out through there and round into the hall, you get tea, coffee, uh, and a biscuit, so feel free to stay on and uh, have a wee chat, catch up with one another. Don't forget to say hello to all the babies and all the baptism people down the back. Thank you. And of course, Victoria, <gasps> father of the bride's just run out. <laughs> is that enough, has he? Okay, <laughs> right. Uh, oh, it's a wee bit wet, so I'm guessing we're inside, yes. Other thing is to say, there'll be no service this Thursday, or for the next three Thursdays, actually. No service for the next three Thursday mornings. Aside from that, we'll be back here next Sunday at 11. <laughs> okay. If you want to sign up Camp Beaver, Catherine is keen to sign up, people sign up for Camp Beaver. Just talk to you, is that the easiest? Can you do it online as well if you want? Okay, you can do that online or talk to Catherine this morning. We need volunteers for Camp Beaver and that's about second week of August, isn't it? That's when that's happening. Thank you all. Thanks for being here. See you soon. Thank you to, uh, isn't Jeffrey looking well today? <laughs> <laughs> Never, never seen him looking better. <laughs> okay. okay. Thank you. See you outside. Okay. <laughs>